I did something last night, Josh, that I probably should talk about a little bit at least, just so okay. people know. Okay. So launch out on the loop as we discuss rediscovering your roots or something clever like that today on Curiosity Continuum. You kick it off today, Josh. Hey, everybody. This is Josh. And this is Brian. Welcome to the podcast for Curiosity Continuum. Curiosity Continuum is an industry-innovating, non-traditional company, passionate about growing wisdom in the next generation. We are the essential bridge between the analog and digital worlds by building collaborative communities that unleash the power of adaptive expertise and innovation needed to thrive in the 21st century. We combine and mix essential elements needed to empower people to succeed in new ways not possible outside of a creative, thoughtful, diverse community of fellow curious people. Follow us on your favorite podcast app to receive notifications of new content. If you like what you hear and you want to dive deeper, please visit us at curiositycontinuum.com. Thanks for tuning in. Let's start the conversation. So I said rediscovering your roots. Yeah. This is something that uh, Brian's going to talk about a little bit, but um, I know you've been... He's been talking about it with me on the back end for quite a while. And I've always said, yeah, go and do more of that. And so I think that's a good um, kind of way to lead into this, Brian. Just like, say what, like what this was and why you decided to do this kind of stuff. I went to a dinner of Korean adoptees. First time ever in my life. And so this is a, this is a big event for me just to go out and do this. I joined a group about a few weeks ago or so, and these are Korean adoptees within my state. And Brian is a Korean adoptee, by the way. So If you've never seen my face. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> I will interject that some people have told my mother, my white mother, that we look alike. And I've wondered, you know, what type of strong <laughs> something or other has entered their system for them to think that, because we look nothing alike. However, I was adopted and I grew up in central Minnesota, and like many Korean adoptees, they grow up in households where people don't look like them. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, depending if they have multiple. But, but you and your mom look so much alike, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's like, the hair. It's the black hair. Because your mom had black hair, hair and before. Right. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, when you met her, she was already coloring her hair. So. Yeah, I know. But uh, was it? You know? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's it. <laughs> So I actually organized a dinner. It was a small, small bunch of us. It was just me and two other folks that uh, sat down actually at a Korean barbecue restaurant, which is only the second time I've done that. Great. I've had Korean food otherwise, but this whole experience, really fun. Now, for some of you, you go, oh, that sounds really cool. And it, it was cool. I loved the conversation. I loved to talk. And I'll tell it this way. When you're... When you're in my shoes or in other Korean adoptees shoes, sometimes you're not comfortable in your own skin growing up. Right. And that kind of thing can kind of carry along with you just because there's not either a, a cultural reference or B, um, you know, depending on how diverse of a community you grow up in, like there's not as much of that. Right. You know, uh, and some of it is just like just not availability of resources. And some of it was in the era when I grew up, there was a different, approach as far as kind of talking to children of a different race than their parents and it was all colorblindness right like you're wonderful just the way you are you're good you're wonderful and uh, please i take i take that affirmation i hope you got that affirmation also it doesn't do anything when somebody's rude or obnoxious or mean you know right. for reasons that like their own broken places drive and how do you deal with that and that that's a big question that i'll just kind of leave there to let people like what do you do with that well there's a real world where that has its outworking so it's like you raise your hand and say hey i'm a korean adoptee which automatically should tell you <laughs> that you don't know korean that you're not culturally korean. right right and there's a lot of assumptions that people when they see me is like oh well you know the things i'm like 
I'm pretty sure I don't know the things you think I know. And I have been in situations where people like are like thinking like you know Korean or like other Asian languages and you don't. <laughs> I'm fluent in Asian. Folks. <laughs> yeah. Fluent in looking Asian. That's about it. <laughs> my one of my favorite lines from current quasi current cinema is in the first Captain America where Cap looks at the guy and says, where are you from? He says, Fresno. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yep. I'm like, it just resonated in my heart. It was yep. such a great line. <laughs> I tell this to people. Like, I, I, had, I was excited and I had some ambivalence about going. And it's kind of one of those things where if you have like nerd proclivities like I did growing up and Josh grew up, sometimes you let your nerdness hang out. Other times you're a little bit shy about showing your nerdness because it's a little bit weird or awkward, right? Or if like you're in a support group with people with the third nipple. <laughs> right, a, right. This you're just announcing right off the nipples. bat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I know this is the case with you. So that awkward part is gone. The The bigger thing is just like working and just talking because you're very different than people, but you have a shared experience that you kind of riff on, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the starter bread, starter culture of the conversation. Great conversation, a lot of great food. And it's such a great thing to talk to other folks that share a similar thing and you can still engage in the conversation because what I learned is how other people processed it, right? I'm a little bit newer-ish, I'll say, to learning about Korean culture and things and, you know, have not yet done all the DNA things that other people have done. I've not gone back to Korea yet at the time of this recording, although that is on my list to do. What's interesting is to kind of understand how people have processed it. And a lot of that is a good learning for me because you kind of learn what other people did and you kind of adapt, right? And this is some of the ways we talk about in this podcast, like, you know, kind of what's your context that you're coming into? What's the awareness? Are you aware of your own context? Right. How did you adapt and how did you build a community? So in the adaptive layer, it's interesting to kind of hear the things that other people have processed differently than me because they have a little bit different worldview. They have a different age, life stage type of thing. I want to pause here for a minute and I want to ask Josh a question because Growing up in the town we did, you know, it was you know pretty Scandinavian German for the most part, right? Yeah, yeah, Minnesota. Well, Minnesota is that way, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what it is. But let me ask you this question: Growing up, you were one of you're one of my lifelong friends. What did you see when you saw me, and say, "Hey, like, let's be friends"? Because obviously, there's things you learn culturally and socially and stuff. But tell me that that perception of of. It's the Brian show tonight. What what was your perception on me? Because what is happening in this experience is that you're kind of re-examining how you've looked at things or remembered things. Sure. And so what I'm trying to do is contextually reframe to understand what other people saw, what I saw about myself, and it's it's very enlightening. It would be enlightening for me too, because if I understood why I said, Hey, let's like hang out, it would be I, I just I don't know really why we started hanging out. I mean, it was more of uh, Brian and I were kind of like outcasts anyway. Like I was kind of like the awkward kind of nerdy kid in the class that we were in. And Brian was just like, I don't know if it's because he was different or if it was because he was kind of intense even then. And, pe <laughs> and, and a lot of kids were just kind of like, eh, you know, um, Brian had been in that school district longer than I had. And so I didn't really have any friends. So I think that I saw like Brian, he would always talk to people, but never really hang out with people. And I'm like, oh, I'll start talking to Brian. And then once we started talking, I realized that we actually had a lot in common in the way of like just shared interests. Like, uh, like maybe I got you into more sci-fi than you had been in before and that kind of stuff. But I think that Brian was like almost like, me in a way that we were older than we were we were like adults in like little kid rappers you know <laughs> and that i know like people are like oh it's so cute and everything no it's actually really lonely to be like a kid that like knows a lot of things about stuff and knows a lot of life lessons already it's kind of sad in a way like you shouldn't have those issues right you should just be a little kid 
because you have your whole life to be older. And I think part of the reason, like, Brian liked games. I like games. So we just kind of like, that's what we kind of bonded over at first. And then my love of games, you know, it's like this whole game collection thing is like me trying to be a kid again for like ever. And it's never, it's never going to work. You know, I always (laughs) say I'm a man child, that kind of thing. But um, I think that's why, I mean, that's my real recollection of it. I, and obviously it's been like 40 years now. So it's, it's, or close to it anyway. And it's been, uh, I think it changes over the years, like why we hang out and why we continue to do stuff. Um, you know, Brian has a family and stuff. Now I have a family and all that, but I don't like, we live a far apart and we still keep in contact. So that's like, that tells you that we actually want to do it because it's super easy to tap out and not talk to people. And I think so, social media actually helped that a little bit. Let, let, let me, I mean, you touched on something that just made something light up in my brain here. We both had a desire for a friendship or for something other than that, because there was a lonely aspect or yeah. like a not known aspect. I'll put it that way. Right. Right. And I think all of us can say that we have a not known aspect about ourselves that desires to be known Yeah. without waxing so poetic. There really is that component of you. And I mean, human beings are creatures of like we live in societies. We live in groups for a reason. You know, we don't want to be alone. What happens when you're young and you move to a new town or you're adopted or you have an experience where you're not part of the group? You find ways to either a be part of that group or you create your own group. Sure. And sometimes I think that when you are the person who maybe is the one that feels on the outside, whether it's by perception or by reality, you look for other people to kind of, uh, you almost see the mark of loneliness. That sounds very dramatic when I say it that way, but it's not in a desperate sort of way, but just like, yeah, like let's, let's choose to hang out and actively engage with one another. And Josh and I for years, always said like we chose to be friends and if you look look at our friend group you know if we choose to be friends we choose to be friends and sometimes there's convenient friends and sometimes there are those that endure and the ones that endure is is a relational choice and what i want to i want to thank josh for making the relational choice and growing up to be part of that friendship arc right yeah really important thing that as we got older we've shared and recollected on things in the past there are are things that i I think I would have been a very, I know I would have been a very different person had I not had enduring friends, if I had not had companionship, if I, people weren't willing also to be friends with me. Right. You you know, you end up like um, Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker, which is not a happy guy. (laughs) No, and and, and, and kind of in a sad way, really reflects his life. Um, And I think that's why that, like he was good at the role, honestly, because he was just kind of playing himself. And when you really break that down, and Mel and I watched that movie again recently, when you really break that down, it's really sad, lonely Very place sad. to be. Yeah, he's got all the money in the world and the fame, but you know his brother died of an overdose. He's, you know, he hangs out with all these people. He's got probably substance abuse problems himself. If he doesn't, or you know, he's in recovery. If he doesn't, that kind of stuff is like super lonely. And if like if I didn't have like Brian as a friend, like especially through like teenage years where it's hard already. <laughs> and you know, you can't really talk to your parents about some stuff, you know, you can talk to your best friend or you can say, Hey man, I really feel like, you know, I'm like the only one. And then they're like, no, you're not crazy. You know, it's just like, it's hard. And I think part of this, too, is like where we grew up. We grew up in a, a pretty good place to grow up. So we didn't we had a lot of support around us, a lot of support structure. Uh, both of our families were, you know, loving families. But I think just going through stuff is together actually really strengthened both of us and made us way different than we would have been. Like you said, I don't think I would have been the same person at all. You know. What I want to encourage people with is this. There's, there's probably something that it's wherever you are in your life that feels a little awkward, but it's very close and near to you. And I would say be curious, be curious enough about it to ask questions, 
and be brave enough to do something about it. I could have waited for somebody else to organize a little dinner. I could have said I need at least 10 people to go. Sure. I, I loved three people at the table, including me, because it allowed for a deeper conversation. Yep. And we had a whole lot of food and I had a lot of leftovers. So that's always a positive. That's a too. Korean restaurant for you, though. You, go, <laughs> you get 45 little bowls that you didn't ask for. That's a Korean restaurant. And you, you like, you know, 39. You're like, maybe. ooh. <laughs> yeah, ooh. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> go find people who have a shared something. Let that be at the start of the conversation. You'd be surprised about what you find out. For me, I know I'll be doing these things as regular as I possibly can. Not because I'm trying to be something that I'm not, but I think it's, it's allowing, giving myself permission to be curious about something that I've not been always comfortable with. And I think it's something that uh, in this phase of life, I'm trying to become more comfortable with that just being there and mm -hmm. not feeling like I have to manage it not feeling like I have to do anything more than just engage in the process of being curious and exploring. And that's what this whole show is about. So I love it. Let's put a comma there and let people digest this, Brian. Thanks, folks. Until next time, this is Brian. And this is Josh. For Curiosity Continuum.